All right. Okay, welcome to our webinar series on open science ability of African research. My name is Ibuka Izeke, project manager at Africa Archive. Before we go on, let me let you know a little about Africa Archive. So Africa Archive is a community-led digital archive for African research communication. By enhancing the visibility of African research, we enable discoverability and collaboration opportunities for African scientists on the continent, as well as globally. Today, we welcome our speakers, Mark Gallenhaus and Aaron Balag. And before we would hear from our speakers, here is um, a little introduction of them. Mark Gallenhaus is, is responsible for business development at the Lens. He joined the Lens in 2019 to support its transition to financial sustainability. Mark has over 25 years of experience in the information industry, working with information handling services, now S&P Global Engineering Solution, and the Institute for Scientific Information, Thompson Reuters, now Clarivet, in various business development and leadership roles. And our second speaker, like I said, is Aaron Balak. So here's a little about Aaron. Aaron is the scholarly content manager for The Lens. Starting his career in fisheries research, Aaron moved into research information management when he joined the research services team at James Cook University as the research data and systems analyst. He then joined the research services division at the Australian National University, working on the university's research information systems to analyze and model research performance. As a research data manager, Iran submitted the Excellence in Research for Australia submission for ANU before joining Springer Nature as data product manager for the Nature Index. Once again, thank you, our guests, for joining us today. And also thank you to our audience for joining us. And now over to our first speaker, Mr. Mark Gallinghaus. A warm welcome to you. Great. Mark. Thank you very much, Ibuka, for that um, introduction. Let me um, share my screen. Terrific. Can you see my screen? Yep. This is still coming up. Yeah, we can see it now. Got it. Um, well, it's a real pleasure to join the Africa Archive series focused on open science for the discoverability of African research. Uh, we're very grateful to Joe and Ibuka for including us in these important webinars. We've had the opportunity to partner with Africa Archive for some time now, supporting the country profiles that the Africa Archive team has built to help showcase research output from researchers in Africa. If you haven't had a chance to uh, visit those websites um, on uh, their PubPub Pub service, I encourage you to do so. In today's webinar, We'd like to introduce you to the lens and to show you how we weave together permanent identifiers and other open metadata to create the lens.org platform, a public good designed to improve access to knowledge and accelerate innovation to help solve the problems that humanity faces collectively. The format we'll follow today um, is on the left here. I will speak for a few minutes about the background of the lens and uh, the data coverage on lens.org. My colleague Aaron will then demonstrate the features of lens.org, stepping through uh, different tools that you can use today to improve your research, um, including using lens profiles to add metadata from the lens to your ORCID record uh, to help ensure that your ORCID profile is as complete and comprehensive as possible. Then we'll jump into some use cases and examples, including showcasing research from Africa that has been cited by patents for approved pharmaceuticals in the United States. Our objectives for you, uh, whether you're watching this live today or you're watching it as a recording, 
are to help you to learn about these tools that you can use today to improve your research and uh, help to showcase your research output. Uh, we hope that you'll go away with a better understanding of the lens as a tool um, that is a public good that helps to uh, accelerate problem solving and is a uh, public good resource. Uh, let's see, Aaron or Ibuka, I see that there's some chat items coming up. Oh yeah, okay, so someone else will monitor the Q&A. So just uh, by way of format, uh, we've intended to address Q&A at the end, but you're welcome to post things in chat if you have a question while we're going along. Uh, so briefly, the Lens is a project of the social enterprise Cambia, a nonprofit based in Australia. Uh, Cambia was established in 1991 and uh, got to work on a number of different projects, um, including uh, the Lens, that was launched first as the patent Lens in the year 2001. At the time, it was the world's first free and open full text patent search platform. The team at Cambia continued to develop the lens over the next uh, 10 or 15 years, including adding uh, a fully searchable data set of gene sequences, publicly dis or disclosed gene sequences in patents um, that was part of a service launched in 2006. Um, and in uh, 2017, the lens team added scholarly literature alongside the patents and linked the two, um, the patents and the scholarly works, and then rebranded what was called the patent lens to just the lens. The whole platform has been up and running for over 22 years now um, as a uh, open, shareable, and reusable resource. Um, it differentiates itself from other open platforms in that it is fully privacy and confidentiality assured. Um, the lens does not profile its users and then resell that data. The lens does not track search terms and resell that data. The secret sauce behind the lens is our meta record strategy. What we do is ingest a set of scholarly works and patents from a number of different sources, each with unique metadata facets that all help to um, add information about um, a data record. Uh, we have a paper that describes our entire process, um, and there's a link to that here. We'll circulate these slides uh, at the end of the presentation, and you're welcome to take a more careful review of our full process um, behind creating the meta record and creating this very comprehensive set of open metadata, including permanent identifiers. The two content sets that the lens is built on are the, is the scholarly data and the patents. The scholarly data is ingested from uh, these four main sources that you see on the left, Microsoft Academic, Crossref, PubMed, and OpenAlex. From this data set, we create uh, a set of 265 million scholarly works. Roughly 50% of those are peer-reviewed journal articles. We also extract references, which help us to link the records uh, through those citations and identify uh, records that uh, have been cited by their peers. Uh, we also have ingested the Springer Nature full text and make that fully uh, discoverable uh, or make the, the uh, that improves our index so that those records can be more easily um, discovered using the lens.org platform. The patent data is ingested in a similar way. We, uh, we ingest a number of different sources that help us to create a data set of over 150 million patent records that are sourced from 106 jurisdictions. I mentioned that we create a data set of gene sequences. Uh, those are extracted from almost 900,000 biological patents and that help us to create a data set of over 450 million fully searchable biological sequences. What we think we do uniquely is build the knowledge graph that you see on the right here. The knowledge graph uh, incorporates the scholarly works and the patents that I mentioned earlier, as well as a number of other metadata sources that help us to make this data accessible to our users so that they can glean the insights that they need to, uh, to understand 
about the, the state of the innovation record. We use a number of tools to build this, uh, this, this um, knowledge graph, but what we think is really powerful is the author's choice of uh, references in the scholarly works and the patent examiner and inventor's choice of citations in the patents. It's the human intelligence behind those decisions that help to make the whole knowledge graph as powerful as it is. From those two content sets, we make the content available in a discovery and analytics tool for patents and scholarly works. We have a separate platform for searching the sequences called uh, PatSeq. PatSite is a tool that lets us see how a patent exists in the innovation record, showing cited and citing patents. And Inform is a mapping tool. We call it the International Industry and Innovation Influence Mapping Tool that allows us to take any corpus of scholarly works and show how those scholarly works have influenced patents. We take patents as a signal for likely commercial value um, and a translation of research into um, something that will that will be used by society. The data is also accessible through an API facility for users who need programmatic access to the information. We built a number of tools that help users to uh, use, reuse, and share their work on Lens.org. Um, they can share those either privately with colleagues or publicly uh, in an open environment. We have a number of slides that step through each of the apps on Lens.org. Um, I'm not going to introduce those through these slides right now. My colleague Aaron will step through examples of how to use the platform. But before I hand over to Aaron, I do want to highlight the uh, final slide in this set that will be made available to you after the presentation today uh, to call your attention to a couple of recorded presentations uh, of Richard Jefferson, the founder and current CEO of The Lens, uh, speaking at the Skoll World Forum for Social Entrepreneurship, where he talks more about the background and principles of The Lens, and an interview that he had with Data for Good um, that talks more about applications of patent information as a source of knowledge. We also have a link to the support site for using Lens.org in case you need some refreshers after seeing the orientation uh, from, from Aaron today. So I will stop sharing now and hand over to my colleague, Aaron. Thanks for that, Mark. Can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, thanks to Burka and Joe for organizing this. Um, and thanks to Africa Archive and the Ubuntu Net. Um, so yeah, as Mark mentioned, we're gonna go through um, a fairly quick demo, if you like, of, of some of the features on the lens. Um, so we won't go into this in as much detail as say a training session, but uh, as Mark mentioned, we'll provide um, links to the support documentation after this um, and some other previous recordings. So I'm just starting on the homepage. Um, we've got a, a, an our app menu here, so you can jump straight into the app that you're uh, wanting to use. Um, but we also have this quick search box on the homepage. Um, so I'm going to start the de demo with a, a simple um, search term. So we'll look for scholarly works uh, that mention the word Kenya, um, and that's in any field, basically. So we are now looking at the, what we call the search results page. Um, and we can see we're, we're getting 320,000 scholarly works that mention the word Kenya somewhere in the metadata. Um, I'll just point out the, the menu at the top again. Um, so we've got a number of different links here. Uh, you've got your work area linked here um, when you're logged in with your account, and we'll go through that uh, in a bit. And the support um, resources that I mentioned. So we have our support center linked here that you can um, search for various things. Um, and that will provide a fairly detailed support post. So for any sort of questions, I'd use this as your first resource. Um, we also have a feature tool, which I find is a, a, a good way to give an overview of the um, results, uh, the different components of the results search results page. So I'm gonna kick that off um, and have a look at these different components. So firstly, starting on the side here, we've got a number of different sidebars, um, starting with the filters. 
But as you can see here, there are a whole bunch of different ones related to the work area. So when you're logged in with your account um, and you've created different work area items, there's a number of different custom sidebars here specifically for accessing those work area items quickly and using those. Uh, the filter sidebar, so this is a key component of the search results page. Um, so this allows, allows you to refine your search. So filter it down, um, facet it. We have a number of different uh, flags, useful flags. Um, so you can refine the, the date, your search results by different metadata. So these are, these are Boolean flags. So whether it has funding or uh, chemicals associated with full text and abstract, et cetera. Uh, authors, institutions, institution countries. Um, just to highlight the importance of PIDs uh, again. So these countries are associated with institutions that have a matched bore identifier um, associated with the author affiliation. So, you know, this is one, a good example of why it's important to ensure the PIDs are, are used throughout the scholarly infrastructure and within the metadata. Um, they help things like these sort of facets. Um, there's a few other filter types that I'll let you go through in, in your own time. Uh, at the top, we've got our quick search bar. So this is where you would enter your query. So if I wanted to modify my query, I can do it here. Um, Next to that, we have our search tips, and I'll just point this out. Um, we use a, a Lucene search syntax. Um, there's a, a quick description of that here, but there's a few different support posts covering our search syn syntax and um, Boolean search logic down the bottom there. Uh, you'll, you can also check out the data coverage. Uh, so we can see it was last updated on the 1st of December. Um, the coverage that Mark mentioned before, and that's just a further breakdown of the different uh, metadata and entities in the current data release. And finally, the field tips, so another important tab there. Um, so you can actually see the, the field names and descriptions uh, for all the different fields that you can use in your search and query syntax. So that's the quick search bar. Below that, we've got our query details. So you can see my search term Kenya um, and any filters that you will have applied will be will appear below that. Uh, below that, we have what we call our metrics carousel. So this just provides a number of different metrics um, and provides a summary of your existing search results. So we can see here in our search for Kenya, there's 320,000 scholarly works. Um, of those, 3,000, over 3,000 have been cited by a patent. Uh, for a total of 12,800 citing patents um, and 18,000 patent citations. And of the 320,000, about half have been cited by another scholarly work for a total of over 4 million scholarly citations. So this just provides a quick metric summary um, of your result set. Uh, below that, we've got our different tabs for our search results. So this is quite an important um, section you know, we, we start on the scholarly works, our, our result set, um, but next to that, you have the explore citations tab. And what this allows you to do is jump into exploring the citing scholarly works. So these would be the forward citations or the scholarly works that have cited one of these um, scholarly works in this result set. So one of the 161,000 that have been cited by another scholarly work, you can actually go and view those scholarly works and explore those. Um, the cited scholarly works or the references, also known as the backward citations. So you can also go and explore those. So those would be the works that have impacted or influenced um, this, this result set. And you can look at the citing patents. Um, and we will look at, so these are the patents that cite one or more of these scholarly works um, in this result set. So we will look at all these citing tabs uh, in a little bit. On the right-hand side here, we have a number of different views. So we're currently on the list view. Um, we also provide a tabular view for people who prefer a, a tabular layout um, and an analysis view, which allows you to create a, a custom and editable uh, analysis dashboard with a, a variety of different chart types, which we'll definitely go into in more detail after this. Uh, below our tabs, we've got a toolbar, set of toolbars. Um, so I can select results. So if I've logged in, I could add you know, the selection to my collection, for example. Um, you can expand the results in the result list. 
and to see more metadata, you can customize your result list. So if there are certain features that you don't want to see, uh, for example, the matching snippet, so I want to tighten up the result list and hide or show that. Um, I can save this as a query and I'm not logged in currently, um, but you can save that as a query onto your account uh, and or you can share this particular search with anyone. So you don't have to be logged in to share a search with anyone. You can export the results. So if I'm not logged in, I can export up to a thousand results. If I'm logged in, I can export up to 50,000 results at a time. And you can toggle on the, the analysis sidebar or choose your, um, your sort order for your result set. So below that, this is one of the records in our result set. So it's an individual scholarly work um, with showing a bit of the bibli bibliographic metadata for this uh, for this scholarly work. So we can see the, the publication type, open access, the journal, volume issue, publication date, authors, the citations, and then any PIDs that are associated with this work. Uh, we have a number of different pills that we use to uh, indicate the availability of certain metadata. So this one is open access, it has author affiliations, and it has uh, fields of study associated with it. Um, and as I mentioned before, you can expand these in the result set to see a little bit more metadata for each work. So this one doesn't have an abstract yet, but we can see the authors, and we can see some of these authors have both a, a Microsoft Academic identifier, but also their ORCID identifier associated with this work. Uh, mesh terms. So if it's um, if it's in the uh, if it's from PubMed, um, if it's available in PubMed, we can get the the medical um, headings, fields of study, the institutions or the author affiliations associated with the, the authors, any links to other external um, locations, the publication information. So a bit of, a bit about the publisher dates. Um, acceptance and receive uh, publishing events, uh, open access locations and information, and then again, any um, any PIDs that are associated with this particular work. And then lastly, on our result sets, we have uh, this, this quick analysis sidebar. So this just provides a quick graphical overview of your results. Um, and it's kind of like a, a preview of what you can do in the analysis uh, tab. Um, you can see here we've got the, the top institutions in this result set. Um, we've got the time series, publications over time, uh, prominent authors. So these are uh, authors in this particular result set that have their ORCID identifier associated with their works, uh, the top countries and regions, and then the top authors, regardless of whether they have an ORCID identifier or not. So that just provides a quick overview of um, the result set. Uh, so now we're going to try and do a few examples. And let's say we are interested in searching for the University of Nairobi. Um, so I can just right from the sidebar there, I can launch a new search for University of Nairobi. It's the same as using the filter as well. So I could have uh, opened up the institution filter and filtered on the, inst the University of Nairobi. Um, so you can see now we're looking at uh, the University of Nairobi Scholarly Works. There's 13,500, of which 255 have been cited by 897 patents. Um, nine, over 9,500 of these scholarly works have been cited by another scholarly work for more than 255,000 uh, total scholarly citations. Uh, and again, we can use that Explore Citations tab to look further um, into this. Before I do that, though, let's have a look at looking at the PIDs. So I want to have a look at what are the top cited scholarly works um, that have come from uh, an author affiliated with the University of Nairobi. And so we can see here, this is our, our top cited scholarly work um, affiliated with the university. So there's a total of five and a half thousand citing uh, scholarly citations. Um, if we open that in another tab and have a look. So we've got the bibliographic metadata that we can see in the result list at the top there. Sorry about that. Um, and then we've got a number of different tabs for this particular work. 
So we've got the abstract on the summary tab. Um, we've got the authors, uh, any affiliated institution dossiers from Inform. Uh, we can see here that a few authors have linked uh, their orchid, their lens profile, with these with this particular scholar work, um, and we will have a look at one of those. And then we can see the author affiliations and the institutions associated with the authors. And just to show Nairobi. You can see it's affiliation number 189. So it's obviously a highly uh, collaborative paper. Uh, and we can see there it's got the ROAR identifier associated with that affiliation. Okay, so this is one of the authors that has claimed their authorship on that, on that scholarly work. Um, so this is what we call our lens profiles. And again, if you log in, create an account, you can link your account, your lens account to your ORCID record, and you can use this lens profile to update your ORCID record. So you can claim all your authored scholarly works in the lens and sync them up to ORCID. You can do the same with patents if you're an inventor. Um, so we can see here, Ravi uh, Marotra has 324 scholarly works, so quite a prolific author, um, quite a high open access ratio of 65%. Um, Seventy-one percent of his works are collaborative, so they have another institution affiliated. Um, he's got a very high number of citations, so nearly fifty thousand total scholarly citations and fifty-five patent citations. So you can click each one of those and drill down into um, run a search, basically, basically to see those scholarly works, citing scholarly works or patents. Um, we can also see his career information. So this is being pulled directly from Orchid um, in real time. So we've got his employment history there, uh, education, any co-authors. So these are from the, the Lens Scholarly Works. Um, mentions, these come from Impact Story. So anywhere any of his works have been mentioned, uh, any funding acknowledgements, projects, and other external links that, um, that Ravi has recorded on his on his orchid record. So I'll log in to my account shortly and we'll um we'll look at how you can use this to update your orchid record. Uh just continuing on for the different parts of the individual scholarly work. So we've got the citing patents. So if there are any patents that cite this scholarly work, they'll be listed here. And you can actually um, run this in another search in the patent search and do further analysis on that. You can do the same thing for the citing scholarly work. So I can uh, run this in a scholarly search and drill down, analyze that further. Uh, the references. So these are the references that have been declared on the for this scholarly work. Uh, any recommended works. Um, so these will only be for older publications currently, but uh, we're adding recommended works from OpenLX. And then lastly, any collections. So th these are public collections in which this particular work exists. So we can see the first one there is uh, one of my collections uh, for the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research in India. So this one was a very highly collaborative um, scholarly work, had lots of different authors from different universities around the world, but it would seem. Uh, it's in some of the Africa Archive collections we can see, and then any other users that have made their their collections public will appear here. So that's just a quick overview of an individual scholarly work. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, missed the the citation um, chart on the right here, so you can look at the citing scholarly works or the citing patents, uh, the publication information that we touched on before, open access locations, and the PIDs or the different sources for this for this work. Okay, I'm going to jump back to our search and we'll have a look at um, exploring the citations a little bit more. So as we mentioned, we can actually look at the citing scholarly works. So for this 13,500, nine, uh, nine and a half thousand have been cited by another work um, and there are nearly 200,000 citing scholarly works. So we can actually look at the citing scholarly works and analyze those further. Um, sometimes these join queries just take a little bit to load. So if it's taking its time, just uh, 
just be patient with it. These are large join queries. But effectively, you can do the same thing on one of these on one of these citation tabs as you can on the search result tab. So I can then refine this further. So for example, if I'm interested in you know, recent publications, so recent citations, if you like, um, anything after let's say 2020, let's wait for it to finish loading. There we go. So yeah, I can I can refine this further and look at recent citations since 2020. Um, I might want to look at citations from a particular institution or a particular country if I'm looking for collaborators, for example. So you, you can really use this to drill down. There's quite a large number um, that have that are recent citations. So if I look at these publication time series, if I clear that. We can see a, a large proportion of these citations are occurring in the last in your know, recent three years. Uh, we can do the same for the site of scholarly works. So, if we want to look at um, the, the research that has influenced the the result set that we were looking at, we can look at the site of scholarly works. Um, I'll just bring up the definitions here while we're waiting. So, we can see the citing scholarly works are also known as forward citations. Cited scholarly works, I typically call them um, uh, references, also known as backward citations. And then we've got the citing patents, uh, which is effectively a forward citation from a scholarly work to a patent, whereby the patent cites the scholarly work. And we have the, the equivalent uh, set of citation tabs if you're doing a patent search as well. Give it a minute. There you go. So now looking at the cited scholarly works, and again we could drill those down further to see which you know which institutions or you know, what uh, what subject matter have influenced the research the results set that you're looking at. Um, but we can also look at the citing patents. So this is one aspect of influence that we're um, sort of keen to. The, the lens is sort of uniquely placed to expose um, by exposing this citing patents join you can jump over and quickly look at the patents so these 890 patents that cite uh, one or more scholarly works from university of nairobi and you can see which companies are being influenced by um, the research in your result set i'll jump back to our original query um, and i see there's a few questions in the chat so i might just stop there before we, the next thing we'll have a look at is the analysis dashboard. Uh, is there any questions there for me? I need to answer them up. No, it's just some background information uh, for the audience. You're free to continue. Thank you. Okay, so this is our analysis um, dashboard. So the what this is, is a, it's a set of configurable charts. So each one of these charts um, has a, menu options that you can change and configure yourself. Um, so you can basically create a, a customized dashboard that shows the, the charts and the facets that you want to show, and you can save that and share that with anyone. Um, you can also create, uh, use, use a dashboard as a template effectively. So when you create a dashboard and save it, it gets saved along with your existing query, but um, you can apply a, a dashboard template to any query. And I'll show you how to do that. So this is what we call our preset dashboards. We've got a time series, uh, we've got institution, top institution logo grid, um, publication types, top authors, um, top cited scholarly works. So this is the, this is that scholarly work we were just looking at. Our top cited with five and a half thousand citations. Um, the top fields of study, so you can see you know, what what subjects or what disciplines are covered, uh, the institution, uh, the, the countries, and journals, and but you can show basically anything um, that you can facet in these charts. So we've got a you can see now that the toolbar has changed now that we're on the analysis tab. If we wanted to add another chart, let's say for 
I was interested in seeing which funders have funded this research. You've got a number of different preset um, charts across the different entity types. So I can quickly add a logo grid, for example, for funders. We can see which funders um, coming from the funder acknowledgements, and that, that data comes from Crossref and PubMed, uh, which funders have um, contributed to this research. So we can see NIH is a, a prominent one, uh, Wellcome Trust, the UK uh, Medical Research Council, the WHO, um, CIHR in Canada, uh, USAID. So you can actually create a, a dashboard with the charts that you want to see in here. Um, let's say I wanted to, <clears throat> because we have NIH uh, a few times, let's say I wanted to combine all those. We give you a function here to do groupings as well. So if I wanted to create a, a grouping for NIH, you create that and just drag in those different um, NIH funders. There are all the different institutions that are listed under the NIH and I can apply a grouping for those. So I can save that dashboard and share it. Um, you can share a dashboard without having to be logged in. Um, you just can't access it. Uh, you won't be able to access it later. It will only be via the link. So I will put that in the chat as well. Um, also on the dashboard, so just going through the toolbar, um, you can create a new dashboard, basically clear your existing one. Um, you then get what we call our dashboard wizard. So here we've got a, a bunch of sort of pre-designed charts for to show various aspects of the data. So scholarly work, citing patterns, if you're interested in institutions, authors, journals, uh, et cetera. Um, we also have a number of preset dashboards. So the one we looked at was the default preset dashboard. Um, but if we were interested in open access, for example, I could load the open access dashboard. And now we're looking at a, a bunch of different charts that look at different aspects of open access. Um, and again, we're applying it to our current search, which is University of Nairobi. So we can see uh, the majority of scholarly works from the University of Nairobi are not open access, um, seven and a half thousand and 6,000 are open access. And we can see the, the trend in open access over time. Um, again, all these are configurable. So if I was, didn't like that stack chart, I can change it to a line chart. Uh, we can look at the open access license types. Again, the license types over time, uh, open access colors, and I prefer that one as a pie chart. So we can see there's 52% um, of these are gold open access. Uh, we can also use um, different metrics. So you know, we're, we're looking at most of those charts, we're looking at the document count, um, but you can look at a number of different metrics. So we've got average citations, average um, affiliation count, average reference count. You can do unique counts on different facets. Um, sums. So you can kind of create your own metrics with these charts. So here we're looking at the average scholarly citations per uh, by open access status. So we can see that those that are open access on average have a higher um, number of citations. Uh, same with the patent citations, we see a similar trend. Um, we can look at the open access status by institution. So Obviously, University of Nairobi is what we're looking at, um, but these are all other collaborating institutions in this set. Uh, we can look at that by publisher or by journal. So you, you can look at various aspects of the data using this anal these analysis dashboards. Um, I'm going to add another chart just to, as an example, uh, I want a horizontal bar chart, but I don't want institution name. I want to use open access source in this case. Uh, and I'm doing that so we can have a look at the, um, these are the sources of data for our open access information. So the majority of open access information comes from our paywall. Um, we also use the directory of open access journals to indicate open access. Um, we also use PubMed Central, uh, OpenAlex, and um, 
presence in an archive preprint repository. So again, I can share this dashboard with anyone. In this case, because I've loaded a preset, I'm gonna to have to sign in. So I'm gonna save this dashboard. I'm gonna sign in. Doesn't think I'm human. If you do come across this, um, it does clear and eventually works. Okay. Actually, I'm going to save it. Okay, and I'll pop that in the chat too, so you can check that out. All right. Now I'm going to jump back to our results list. And what I wanted to do now, um, we, uh, we use the institution filter. We did a pretty simple query, but we can let's say we were interested in uh, refining our results further down to um, you know, a subset of the University of Nairobi. Uh, and let's say we're interested in finding, looking at COVID research coming out of the University of Nairobi, for example. So there's an option here to edit search. Um, I, I can type directly in the search bar here, um, but you can also use this edit search functionality um, or use the structured search. So I can go full screen here um, and you can then specify the various fields to search within. Um, so if you're wanting to construct a, you know, a more complex query that uses the different fields, um, this would be a better way to do it. I'm not going to limit this search to any specific fields. So we're going to search across all fields. And I'm going to use um, COVID and SARS-CoV-2 as our search terms. And I want to use or as our predicate. So now I'm searching for any scholarly works that mention COVID or SARS-CoV-2 within the University of Nairobi. You can see we get 182 results. Um, so another feature that is part of your, your uh, account work area are the save queries. Uh, actually, before the search queries, I'll just show the search history. So I've got my search history recording on, so you can choose um, when you create an account, whether you want your search history recorded. So you can see that's the query we just ran, uh, COVID and SARS-CoV-2. So you, that's where these sidebars um, come in useful. So you can quickly access your work area uh, items from here. Um, now, let's say I want to save this as a query. I can... title it here. Um, you can give your query a description. You can then also enable notifications for your query. So by selecting this, what you'll do is you'll get a you'll receive an email notification every time um, we update the database and new works are added that match your query. Uh, so that can be a useful thing for researchers, um, a bit of a, an alert service. Save that. And we can now view that in our save queries. So you can see there it is there. This is our save query sidebar. Um, we also have kind of a, a work area sidebar that you can quickly access some of your settings, um, your account settings, your profile, uh, notifications. So I mentioned, you know, I get a lot of notifications from my save queries and collections, my dy dynamic collections. Uh, and you can quickly ac access some of your other work area items here. So let's have a look at that query we just saved. So here's my work area, um, and these are my saved queries. So there's the query we just created. We can see the uh, alerts are enabled. Um, it's public access. If you don't want a public access, you can restrict that. 
they're not discoverable, the, the queries. Uh, we also got your history, so you can quickly access your search history from here um, or from the sidebar. Uh, collections, so we'll have a look at collections next. So I'll jump back into that query. And you can see now I've got an option to save as a collection. So there's a couple of ways you can create a collection. Um, you can select your results and add to an existing collection, create a new collection, and you can remove them from collection if they're already in them. Uh, or you can use this save as collection. So if you're on an existing search, um, what this does is it creates a, what we call a dynamic collection. So it, it creates a save query from your existing search and links it to a collection. And what that does is once that query is linked, that save query is linked with the collection, um, every time we update it, so every time we do an, an alert uh, update, we also add those works to the collection. So it's basically an automatically updated collection. Uh, so let me give it a title. You can give it a uh, description if you like. And I'm choosing to make this a dynamic collection, which will use the existing query that I'm on. Um, I can also ch uh, choose an avatar. So um, I've got a number of different logos that I've uploaded to my um, media library in my account. And one of those was the University of Nairobi's. There we go. Um, logo. So I can choose that to be the logo for the collection. And I can save that. And we can look at that in our collections. So there's the collection I just created. You can see um, it has one link save query. So it, when I created that, uh, when I saved it as a collection, and it automatically created um, this this save query here. So you can see that's a it gave it a, a automatic title, dynamic collection updater um, for that collection name, and we can see the collection that it's linked to. I'll jump back to the collections. There's a few other settings uh, for collections you've access to. So you can edit the um, the access, so you can make it restricted or limited access or public. Uh, you can also import um, Scholar Works into a collection. So if you've got a number of um, PIDs, so you've got lens IDs, DOIs, PubMed identifiers, Pub, PubMed Central, um, or OpenMag or OpenAlex, you can upload those and import those into the collection. Um, there's also on the collection itself, you'll see there is this history tab. So this provides a, a history of the um, all the addition and deletion events from the, the collection. So you can actually add individual works to a collection manually. So you can basically curate it or remove them manually. So if you've got a, a um, a save query that's linked and it's adding some false positive, for example, you can go in and man manually remove those, or if it missed some, you can add them manually. Um, and you'll get a history of that, all those actions here. Uh, you can take notes, add notes to your collection. And there, there's all those settings that we just went over um, in, a, in a single tab. So that is... <clears throat> Uh, a collection. Now the analysis dashboards that we just showed you, you can uh, apply those to a um, a scholarly work, a, a search, search results, but you can also apply them to a, a collection. So I'm going to open up the analysis dashboards. You can see we had the open access dashboard that we had previously, and that loads um, by default. We can clear that. We can load the preset dashboard, or we can open one we just saved. So Let's open that. So you, this gives you the option to either load the original um, query that was saved with that dashboard or use the existing results. So I'm now effectively using that dashboard that I just saved as a template and applying it to this collection. So you can see how you could use a, a dashboard for various different aspects. Um, and we can now see that the majority of this research is open access, uh, unlike 
all of uh, the University of Nairobi's research, which was majority non-open access. Uh, one more one more thing to point out with collections and dynamic collections. So I created this dynamic collection from um, that save as a collection option in the toolbar. You can also add multiple, you can link multiple queries to a, a collection to make it dynamic. Um, and let's go to the work area to do that. So we jump back to the collections. We go to the dynamic tab in the settings. So you can see here, it's got the, the automatic collection uh, query that it saved with it. But I can also add other, uh, other queries to the, link other queries to the collection. And then any results that match any of those queries will get added to that collection um, when it, it is updated. Um, so you can, not only can you put analysis dashboard on a collection, you can do an analysis dashboard on the citing or cited scholarly works as well. So you know, if we look at the citing scholarly works, so these are the scholarly works that cite our, um, the scholarly works in our collection, in our COVID research collection. We can see the results list is 2,250 results or citing scholarly works. That's cite the 182. Um, we can then look at the analysis dashboard for these. So this allows you to you know, create a, a, a dashboard, a custom dashboard for um, not just a single search result, but the citing works and also the citing patterns. So I'm going to go back to our original search. Uh, I wonder if we've got my history. Aaron, we've got about um, six minutes left in the hour. Um, All right, I will and there's... stop it there and uh, see if there's any questions, and then we can look at those examples if you like. Okay. Okay. Um, All right. Ibuka, hand over to you. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mark, and thank you very much, Aaron, for those wonderful presentations. And Thank you for taking us through what the lens is doing to help promote the search work in the world, and especially in Africa. All right, um, we have a question from Mr. Nirenda in the chat, and he wants to know, okay, the question is directed to Aaron. He says, am I expected to pay to use the tools or features on the lens? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, Mark, do you want to answer that one? Sure. I'll um, take that wearing my business development hat. Um, thanks very much for the question. Um, so the lens is a uh, public good, meaning the lens.org platform may be used by uh, anyone when you're not registered. Um, so most of what Aaron just showed us uh, was done when he wasn't registered. So you're welcome to join that uh, to, to access the lens.org platform. You're welcome to click through to any of the links that uh, we've put in the chat and analyze that. If you register, you'll get access to the lens work area, which gives you the tools for his search history, uh, save searches, collections, um, notes, um, and other functionality that Aaron went through. Um, if you use that and register, you need to identify if you're a commercial user or non-commercial user. If you're a commercial user, then uh, to comply with the terms of use, you must pay for a commercial use license. If you're a non-commercial user, so if you're affiliated with a university or a government research institute using it for non-commercial purposes, uh, then you can register and use the work area without payment. We uh, kicked off something we call the Lens Collective Action Project in order to support our pivot to financial sustainability in September of 2021. Um, so that included this requirement for commercial users to pay a commercial use license for public good users, we ask that they subscribe to an institutional toolkit. Uh, so there is uh, pricing for universities, government research institutes, and other uh, public good organizations to subscribe to an institutional toolkit. Uh, with that, we will ensure the financial sustainability of the lens and um, promote uh, open infrastructure to accelerate innovation. Um, thank you, Joe and Aaron. There's two links in the chat that link through to the 
uh, the Lens Collective Action Project, uh, which we call uh, LEAP, which was an equitable access program, and uh, the collective action page that summarizes all this. Thanks very much for that question. Um, I realize I didn't get a chance to show the lens profiles and how to use those. Um, is there anyone interested in using uh, lens profiles and lens account to update their ORCID record? Yeah, I think um, questions the questions on that. What, the, the lens is a big supporter of ORCID. Um, so we, we probably should go through that if we can do it quickly, Aaron. If, there's, if that's all right, I, I certainly can. Okay. How are we doing on time, Ibuka? Um, we have um, just one minute to the top of the hour, but you can just do okay. that quickly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I just went to my profile. Um, so this is my lens profile. I've got my ORCID uh, linked, and I'll just show you where you can link that. So in your account settings, so let's log me out. Um, but if you're logged in and you're on your lens profile, you've got your ORCID account linked. You can just use this, uh, what we call um, uh, authorship claim wizard to find and claim any of your scholarly works. So it, there's three steps. It looks for any of your name variants first. You can see I've got a couple of name variants here. Um, I've already claimed all of my scholarly works. So let's pretend I was um, Aaron Ballard. It's close. So I can say, okay, these are these three are mine. Yet that's me as the author. I want to claim those. You can check that, and what that will do is um, claim your authorship. So they'll show on your lens profile, and it'll also sync them to your orchid record. So I won't claim them. these aren't mine, but that that's as that's as complex as it is. So three simple steps, and you'll be claiming all of your scholarly works and updating your orchid record. Okay, so th thank you very much for that, Stephen. So um, I would like to know if um, there are other questions. If you have any more questions, you can type that in the chat or put on your microphone and ask aloud. Hey, Buka, while they're taking a look at their questions or thinking about their questions, um, I'd like to quickly show uh, how you can analyze the impact that African researchers have had on the um, approved drugs in the United States. Um, okay. So this is a collection so we uh, of the US FDA Orange Book patents. So the Orange Book patents are a list of patents that the uh, federal, I'm sorry, the Food and Drug Administration identifies as the patents that are underlying the approved uh, drugs in the US. They publish this because they want people to be aware of what those patents are and to be aware of what the, the end of the um, those patent rights are so that it encourages generic manufacturers. Uh, but if the theme of our um, of the series is to improve the discoverability of African research, what we'd like to highlight is um, showcasing the impact of African research. Um, so there's 5,600 patents that are deduplicated from a list of about 19,000 patents in the Orange Book list. And using the lens, I can click this Explore Citations button and uh, choose Cited scholarly, scholarly Works. So I click on that. So this is showing me all of the research that is cited by um, those 5,000 patents, I'm going to click through that again, show me all the research that is cited by those 5,600 patents, um, and it comes up with a list of 48,000 papers. From this, I can uh, choose the countries that I want to uh, analyze. If I quickly scan this list to find um, countries in Africa, I see um, South Africa, um, Ethiopia, catch me if I'm missing one, Uganda, Tunisia. You missed a few, but um, I think that shows okay. that 
Zimbabwe, yeah, shows the functionality that we have there. I'll hit refine then. And I only grabbed those five so that the list is more complete, but we come up with 143 cited works. I'm gonna uh, cheat slightly because I actually built this uh, before today's event. So if you go through that list and find every one of the uh, countries in Africa mentioned, we find 262 papers um, that are cited by the patents uh, that underpin the approved drugs in the US. Um, so from here, I can sort this list um, as you saw Aaron show you, and you can analyze um, who it is that, uh, where these papers have been published, which institutions, who their authors are, uh, or any other information that you want to glean. Uh, but this is a way to really showcase the impact that African research has had on, um, on innovation, in this case, approved drugs. I see we've got a couple more questions. Yes, um, we in the have chat. Oh. a question from um, Aurelia Munini. So she's trying to, or she wants you to mention briefly what problem um, you're solving, that's the lens, what problem the lens is solving for scholars, especially those in Africa. Got it. Uh, well, great question. So we, we think that researchers in Africa uh, face some of the um, some unique problems compared to other researchers around the world, as well as some similar problems. Uh, one that Aaron just demonstrated is maintaining the uh, currency of your ORCID profile. Um, so we actually designed lens profiles with researchers in mind because they were coming to us saying we'd like to load our patent our patents onto our ORCID profile, and there wasn't an easy place to get patent metadata. Uh, so we built that front end on Lens Profiles, and we had feedback from users that said, we'd like to also update our ORCID records with our scholarly works. Um, so we added that functionality as well. So one use case would be um, maintaining your ORCID, uh, your ORCID records. So ORCIDs, we've agreed, are an important permanent identifier. We want everyone maintaining those. Um, so that would be a key one. The second is the discovery and analytics tools that Aaron went through. So if you um, have access to a closed proprietary um, commercial service, then, then that's great. It's um, You're benefiting from that service. However, those services are not uh, fair resources. They're not reproducible. They're not transparent. They're not verifiable unless you're a member of the club who also has enough money to pay for those services. So African scholars, like scholars around the world, can benefit by using a tool that is reproducible by anyone, anywhere, to verify the information uh, that someone's providing, whether that's their own uh, research record or a summary of research on COVID that Aaron was um, stepping through earlier or anything else. Aaron, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, I think one of the main things is the the exploration and discovery of the tool, you know, um, and the fact that it is an open platform, which you can then share with any of your colleagues. Uh, it just lowers the barrier to finding information and finding knowledge. Okay, um, thank you very much for that wonderful response. Um, are there more questions? If there are none, I think I have one to ask in here. Um, so um, maybe you would have touched it during um, your presentations, but I would like that you maybe summarize for the audience again. So the question is what role does open access to scholarly and patent literature play in fostering collaboration and knowledge sharing among African researchers and innovators in the lens platform? I hope that question is clear, but why take it again? Aaron, you want to give that a shot? I, I didn't catch all of okay. it, sorry. Okay, um, the question is this. What role does open access to scholarly and patent literature play in fostering collaboration and knowledge sharing among African researchers and innovators on the LENS platform? Uh, what role does open access to patent and, and to, scholarly literature play yes, to, yes. on co collaboration in fostering that, collaboration fostering yes. collaboration right um yes i think the main role that the lens plays in that 
aspect is the ability to identify new partnerships, potential partnerships. So uh, if you're looking at if you're looking at it from the innovation angle, um, you know, if you want to make something new, if you want to invent something, you want to create something, um, often you'll need to know who are the expertise in that area, um, who holds the IP rights, um, who are the experts, you know, which which individuals, which institutions. And I think the lens, as I showed, helps you identify those institutions and those individuals in specific areas that are you know, experts in their area um, that you can ide ideally collaborate with um, and partner with to do something new. Um, and especially when it comes to making something. So if you want to you know, create a new product, for example, um, knowing who then holds the patent rights, who, who holds the IP and where, um, is important to you know, helping de-risk your strategy and actually put together a, a product. So I think partnering is probably one of the, the biggest um, bi biggest benefits of the lens, or bi biggest uses of the lens in that regard. Uh, I will add that okay. open access is, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of links to open access information. Um, as Mark mentioned, we have some index full texts, we have all the Spring and H index full text, um, but that you to access the actual publications themselves, you need to go to those various sources that provide the the um, the full text. Whereas for the patent literature, if it's the patent literature is all open access effectively, so you can read that on the Lens website itself. Yeah, I, I just wanted to chime in and and. Yeah, I think that's a perfect summary because as much as it seems that in a digital area that we all live in, such information will be readily available. Um, unfortunately, like we we don't have such information in such a coherent space like the lens provides with um, access to institutions and individuals alike, like you've showcased in, in the demo. Um, so I think that's really unique and also with such uh, a vast volume of information free of like accessible free of charge that's like a huge win and heavily like uh, uh, it's it's hard to describe in words <laughs> um so it's it's actually like both exciting and and also overwhelming because like i said in the beginning because you would think it's easy to find such information but then it's not and we've we've grown used to not having um, direct access to such information, which is vital for economic development, but now the lens is exactly built for that. Um, and yeah, so any any of you in the audience, if you would like to speak to that or ask anything else, now is the chance. But also, of course, um, we are happy to provide any any further support down the line. But if you want to take the chance now, this is your opportunity. Otherwise, to add to that, Mark. Aaron, feel free to. Um, I think that was a, a good We're, summary. Um, Joe. Very grateful. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Mark. I was going to just, uh, say that it was it is a good summary, and we're very grateful to um, the whole team at Africa Archive, uh, Abuka and Joe, uh, especially for helping to uh, make today's uh, seminar series or seminar possible. Um, but we're looking forward to the rest of the program that you have running into um, the middle of next year. Uh, so thanks for all that you do uh, to highlight the importance of these tools uh, to researchers in Africa as well as around the world. Thank you. For some concluding remarks, Ibuka? Okay. Um, thank you. Um, at this point, let me apologize for the little technical issue I just had. Um, so let me thank each and every one of us for joining us in this webinar session. Like I said, the webinar recording will be found in the links that I will just provide in the chat now. Okay. And um, this webinar series is organized by Internet Alliance and Access to Perspectives. And you can learn more about ORCID on the link which I'll also provide just now in the chat. Give me some seconds. So I want to thank most especially our guests for joining us in today's webinar.
Mark Gallinhouse and Aaron Barlock. And they spoke on the topic, scholarly and business literature as a public good to inform problem solving in Africa. And we have learned a lot from their presentation today. And um, we also have one more session this year, a minimal in the coming year, 2024. So our next webinar session is going to be on December 11th, 2023, with RAW, that's R O R, the institutional identifier. And that's going to be with Amanda Fre French. So she's going to be our guest speaker for our next webinar session. And we're looking forward to having you attend again. So I'll just quickly drop the links I talked about in the chat now. Give me a second. And we'll call it a wrap. And for those who are listening on the podcast, you can find them in the show notes and on our website. Right, so those are the links about the whole webinar series. So at this point, I'll say thank you all for joining us today, especially to our guests, Mark and Aaron. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate that um, you were able to provide us with all of these insights and this wonderful presentation. And to our guests, thank you for joining us today and do have a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you very much, Buka. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Buka. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Joe. Thank you.